Okay, great. Thanks so much for joining us today, everyone. Just as a final reminder, please make sure that you answer the poll so that we know who's with us today. Um, and to also make sure that you have the um, handouts that you can download if you don't have them available via the email we sent you on the chat window below your screen. I'm going to go ahead and um, turn this over. We're going to start the webinar. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to, to Pam Buffington, who is the partnership lead for the Student Success in Mathematics Partnership. Thanks so much, Carmen. Um, it is so great to see how many people are here, and it looks like we've had, we have over 40% of participants who are teachers or teacher leaders. Welcome. Um, we have about 10% school and district administrators, another 7% higher ed, um, and or 10% higher ed, and state education agency staff about 7%. So welcome. It's a great diverse crowd. Um, again, just so you know where you're supposed to be, we're out on the Algebra for All Focus on Visual Representations webinar. Um, and we will be um, transitioning to the webinar um, at this point. As Carmen began in the introduction, today's event is part of a regional education laboratory program administered by the U.S. Department of Education, Institute of Education Sciences. Um, as you will see on this map, um, these 10 RELs across the country are divided up into regions. This particular webinar is sponsored by REL Appalachia. We are, um, up, you can get to us through REL Appalachia at SRI International. Um, we carry out three main activities as um, the REL program. We disseminate findings from research in ways that educators and policymakers can use in practice. We can provide educators and other stakeholders with training, coaching, and technical support they need to use research findings and evidence in the classroom to improve teaching and learning and conduct a wide variety of applied research studies. Working with the REL program, we can include developing sustained partnerships with policymakers to address critical problems of practice. As Carmen pointed out, this particular webinar is sponsored by the Student Success in Mathematics Partnership um, that we have developed in Virginia. Um, you will see through the REL program and REL Appalachia many additional webinars and other um, programs similar to this. We conduct research, provide technical assistance, disseminate research findings as part of this coherent research agenda. We ensure that educational leaders are aware of the resources available through the REL, increase educators' individual and organizational capacity, um, and also uh, increase the use of research findings um, by state education agencies as well. You can see the Student Success in Mathematics Partnership outlined um, in yellow on this particular slide. As um, Carmen pointed out, you can tweet um, and also use this hashtag um, as we are going through the webinar uh, today. If you haven't yet done so, please add to the chat window your name, affiliation, and role so that we can um, see who all is here. And um, we also will have a chance to follow up with you. Today's agenda consists of this welcome and introductions that we are, we are just engaging in currently. The session objectives will frame the research, content, and practices for algebra readiness. We will dig into the purpose of using visual representations as a strategy to support algebra readiness and success for all. We'll connect research to practice using the mathematics tasks that um, you were provided, or if you don't yet have them, they can be downloaded in the download pod. Um, you will we'll access the webinar and well resources. Um, we'll provide you a link at the end of the um, webinar. Finally, in closing, we'll ask you to complete um, a survey about this webinar. So I'm going to do a quick introduction. I'm Pam Buffington. I'm the partnership lead for this partnership. Jill Neumeyer de Piper is a partner member, a researcher, and a math education expert. Carmen 
Haroz is a partnership liaison for SRI education and is very involved in educational research as well. The objectives are to increase knowledge about research on Algebra 1 completion and future student success, increase understanding about how visual representations can support students' algebraic problem solving, especially those who are English learners or who have low literacy skills, increase awareness of the role of ratio of proportion skills and concepts in supporting algebra readiness to engagement with selected ratio and proportion tasks. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. DePiper to talk about um, current research on content and practice for algebra readiness. Jill? Thanks, Pam. So our focus today is going to be on visual representation. To get there, we're first going to talk about the research behind algebra readiness. Completing Algebra 1 by grade 9 is key to preparing students for on-time graduation and life after high school. This has been a conversation that's been had nationally for 20 to 30 years about the importance of Algebra 1. Algebra 1 first sets up students for later mathematics courses, such as geometry and calculus and other post-secondary success. In addition, Algebraic knowledge and understanding leads to careers and other scientific successes after high school and even after college. However, we like to make the distinction that algebra readiness begins well before Algebra 1 coursework. It really begins in elementary grades. So students, as young as the two in this photo, when they're working with number and operations, or those missing number problems, are beginning to think algebraically. And in this way, those comparisons of relationships, or as they get older, the fraction problem solving they're doing, is part of algebra readiness. Students are thinking about operations, and they're thinking about other ways to express their thinking. And the mastery of these foundational elementary grade concepts is critical for students to be even ready for Algebra 1. In this way, the mathematics content in upper elementary and middle grades is important for students as they then get ready for the concepts that underground algebraic reasoning. In this manner, the ways in which we think about the progression to Algebra 1 goes from elementary students here through upper elementary into middle grades. And at the end of middle grades, or sometime in middle grades, we really start talking about proportional reasoning. So proportional reasoning ends up being a content area that's discussed in sixth and seventh grade a lot when students are thinking about ratios or other proportional reasoning relationships. It sometimes gets highlight, highlighted more when we talk about slopes. And the idea is that in order for students to reason proportionally, they lean on a lot of the elementary concepts that they learned in earlier grades. And in this way, research has called it this cornerstone of higher mathematics and then the capstone of elementary concepts. We've really found that proportional reasoning plays out in many problem-solving situations as students begin to understand relationships and quantities in different ways. In addition, this understanding of proportional relationships is related to specific mathematics courses because relationships between quantities are key to functions and variations. We'd like to highlight this with an example. So here comes a task for you. I think. OK. In, in fifth grade, there are five times as many students in the choir than in the band. There are 48 grade 5 students in the choir and band combined. How many grade 5 students are in the choir? I'd like you to think for a minute, what are the proportional relationships that you would use to solve this task? I'm not asking for the answers right now. Think of the proportional relationships. You may share some of your thinking now in the chat. I 
I see a few people typing, and then we will continue to discuss this. I'm going to give you some more think time. I see a five to one choir to band, part to part, and part to whole relationships. Ooh, I see some X's in there. So the activity will still stay on the left here as well as up in the other screen. And I'm just going to list some that we saw beforehand. So five to one, choir to band students. I see someone else also mentioned the six parts total. The five to six, choir students to total students. The 40 to 48 students is another relationship in here. The idea is that these different relationships are coming out in this proportional reasoning task, and they are part of relationships that relate to Algebra 1 coursework. And I see if you look through the chat right now, it's really interesting. You can see a lot of people are emphasizing this with their symbolic representation, some equal signs. I see like five band plus band, you know, and so this is really neat. And that's really what we're showing. In order to solve something like this, you can think many different ways about it. And these understandings relate to what we would call Algebra 1 concepts that seem to be emblematic of the course. I would like you to think of other ways, though, in this, when I'm going to show you this next picture, or visual on the slide, just skimming what's happening here. And I think it's really interesting. I'd like you to look for some of the relationships you just mentioned in this visual representation that is now on the screen. So this same task is now represented differently. I'll give you a minute to look at it. And I'd like to know, does anyone see that same 5 to 1 in this mathematical visual representation? You can see there's five boxes with the blue. So yes, the blue to red. Oh, I needed it just said like five, five red, five to one, right? You can see the blue to the red. And you can see with the brackets where that 48 is listed as well. So this is one way to show this relationship. And in some ways, a visual representation like this can be a way to generalize these relationships as well. It's not just about 48 students. You can see that there's a certain number of boxes and that the eights are filled in. This is a different way to show this than showing it with numeric representation. If I move on to another visual representation, this one's a little bit different. Here you can again see the 1 to 5 ratio. But if you look at it carefully, the problem solving of the student may have been different. You can see the division here, thinking maybe these different boxes represent a certain quantity after the student divided by six. Then you can take the number of boxes related to the choir to find out the number of students. Now, at the beginning, we were not asking for the solution, you know, how many students were in the choir, even though this was a question. I was asking you how you would represent it. Because the relationships are really important in this and help relate, help support students in understanding these algebraic concepts. Not only is there the same number in each, in each box, but the boxes are about the same size. And even if they weren't the same size, if this was a visual representation the student were sketching for him or herself, Putting the number in then helps you see that as well. So I think that's important, how the boxes relate to the problem solving. I also think what's really neat in this task is how even though the task is about five times as many students in the choir than in the band, students also need to understand that in some ways this task is about six boxes, right? There's band and the choir. <laughs> And that six comes from this attention to the band students plus the choir students. And 
some individuals in the chat at the very beginning mentioned that, and that's really important. So as we are going to continue here, we're going to move to some other tasks. And discussing how these visual representations move on to other tasks and show other relationships as well. In this way, visual representations can be a way for many students to present their mathematical thinking, as well as engage in problem solving. As we continue to show these visual representations, please enter any other thoughts or questions into the chat box. So what are mathematical visual representations? A mathematical visual representation can be a drawing. Up in the right there, you can see where we've enhanced a figure in a geometry task by adding labels and um, notations to it. A mathematical visual representation can also be a diagram, a tape diagram, a number line, a double number line. Visual representations can help show relationships that weren't as apparent otherwise. For example, in the one on the left where you can see the blue shading and the green shading, the ways in which those thirds and six add up to be half, you might not see that in another way. In this way, we really like visual representations because of the relationships they can show and other ones that they can unearth and present that might not have been apparent before. You know, hidden relationships, maybe. Using them in teaching has a few, has, has, has a few very important reasons. And, um, but I think we need to step back and re recognize that visual representations, they're not just an alternative to problem solving for students, but they are what competent mathematical mathematical thinkers use when they're doing explaining mathematics. And that's what's very interesting, that using a visual representation is a way to present your thinking in a flexible manner and another way to share what you're doing. In this way, visual representation, it's not a picture of what, you're, of what the mathematics is. For example, with the with the task before, we weren't talking about choir students or band students with stick figures of kids or noting their instruments. Instead, we're trying to show the mathematical relationships and the quantities. A mathematical visual representation that a student creates can reinforce the student's understanding of rational number concepts. And in this way, we're really encouraging students to be drawing their visual representations, not as a presentation tool from a teacher, but the students in showing what they understand. And in this way, they increase their own understanding by presenting their thinking. They represent mathematics different ways, and students can talk through them. And as, as a completed visual representation, it can be a way that students talk through and explain their thinking. They can point to what they mean in different ways. And they can explain pieces that might have not have been apparent before. Not every visual representation works well for the same content. And so understanding how to select a representation that works well is also important. There isn't necessarily an incorrect visual representation all the time, but there are ones that are going to be more appropriate or better to highlight relationships. We're going to talk more about this task later. But first, what I want you to do is look at this double number line. And what relationships does this double number line show? The statement says, Sam bought a used motorcycle. It was on sale because it could not go very fast. Sam was able to go 30 miles in three quarters of an hour. So what sort of relationships does the double num number line show? Please place them in the chat and we will discuss this.
double number lines aren't always used in upper elementary school. Many times in middle grades or they get highlighted in Algebra 1 coursework, but they can be really a really powerful way to show relationships because of how they line up the quantities. Miles and hours are aligned. So you can see this relationship between distance and time, and specifically, the 30 miles to 3 quarters of an hour is lined up. You could also calculate different amounts. You could use this to expand or shrink down to figure out where you want to highlight. You could figure out how many miles per hour Sam, or how many miles Sam could go in a half hour or an hour if he's driving at a constant rate, which is what we're assuming. And I think it's, these are also really important because it's also showing three quarters, three fourths, as related to miles in this case, because students in upper elementary and middle grades sometimes don't always think of fractions as having relationships to another whole number. So something like this can be very helpful. When using a double number line like this with students who are English learners, the double number line can provide an artifact that students can reference while discussing the task. Students can identify the mathematic relationships, communicate with a partner or teacher using gestures, using words, pointing, both to show their understanding of the mathematics and to provide the teacher with evidence of their thinking and reasoning. And yes, I have seen, a few people have thought about the exact relationship at 10, 10 miles and where that would be at a quarter hour. You can kind of think through if you've seen someone mention that in the chat. How did they know that? What were you able to do to get there? And at this point, you'll notice this task doesn't have a question on it. And that's because we're, we're not asking you to necessarily solve it, because we want you to focus your conversation here on those relationships and the structures and how they support you seeing those relationships. This is a task we'll delve into more. Um, but if you have any other questions as you're looking at these, and I think, yes, some of these visual representations are emphasized in other practices and Common Core alike. Um, I think using them to show relationships is not only about the mathematical um, content, but it's also about encouraging the practices, encouraging students to understand the relationships they see, as well as using double number lines as a communication tool, as another piece that we're encouraging. When students use a, use a visual representation like this, they can talk through their mathematical reasoning to others, to a teacher, as well as ask questions that they might not know or have been able to articulate with just a, a naked number problem. As we just emphasized, visual representations can present these relationships, such as rate and proportionality. And they're different than pictures in this way because they show the mathematical structure in the problem and about the problem context. In our work, we found that explaining ideas, when students explain their ideas using diagrams, they can understand And the structure in different ways. Understanding how choir students relate to the number of band students in a visual can be an interesting way to think through what the question is asking as well as what the context represents. And specifically with students or English learners, we have found in our research that the ways in which diagrams can reinforce learning of mathematical concepts, they can encourage students to engage in thinking about mathematical structure, in persevering, and in using language and norms of mathematical communication. A visual representation 
it not only can serve as an artifact of students' thinking, but it can also provide a place to get started. If you have a visual representation, such as the double number line or at the beginning with the tape diagram, either one, on the uh, either tape diagram about the choir and band students, students can start talking through it using someone else's diagram to help to explain the problem to themselves or to someone else. And in this way, we really see that visual representation supports students who are English learners and many times students who are low literacy with opportunities to respond to questions and communicate their mathematical thinking. And it can help teachers and other learners make the distinction between what mathematics a student doesn't understand and what reading, literacy, or communication barriers that are in the task. Being able to communicate mathematically about ideas and make conclusions or different arguments a visual representation can help support that conversation. And in addition, as they use this visual representation to communicate their ideas, they can deepen both their non-academic and their academic thinking. A visual representation is also not just a tool to represent their thinking at the end, it can also be a tool for thinking. For example, a student can start something and put out ideas that they're thinking about and use it. It can be a dynamic tool for themselves as they're drawing these boxes or as they're drawing the double number line. They're marking it up and presenting their ideas. And in that way, we've had students say that that visual representation wasn't wasn't for someone else. It was their own thinking tool. And I think that's really important because many times the visual representations are presented as final product, but that's not the idea. It can be someone's ideas as they're moving through, as they're thinking. In some ways, they're this rough draft. And we think that's really helpful for students as they're coming up to new material, as well as as they're trying to share their ideas. So we've presented a lot of background research on this to get us started in thinking about the exact task. And we'd love to know what kind of questions you have about how visual representations can support English learners' engagement in mathematics, or even back to our, com our connections to Algebra 1. I can see some people in the chat mentioning their own experiencing, experiencing, experiences using visual representations with students. And it's really great to see that when you have this visual representation, it's a way for students to share their thinking when they don't have the words to communicate. Some students may have rich understandings of the mathematics that they want to share with you. And by drawing out their ideas, they can then help you understand what they understand. And we found that to be really powerful. We've also found that, yes, not all students know how to get started on a visual representation. So modeling something at one point can be helpful for students. So sometimes we use other students' visual representations or a sample student just so students know how to get started. If a student has never seen someone using a tape diagram, they, you know, with a ratio task, for example, they may not know how to get started on it, or a double number line. And so presenting another student's work, either an actual student in your class or a sample fictitious student, can ha have help students see multiple visual representations. And this idea of having multiple representations, I think, is really important because well, it actually depends on your goal, right? I mean, I really like having multiple ones because they can show different ideas. Um, I think that it can help students make connections between different ideas. But you don't necessarily need a showcase of visual representations that's like a show and tell. You don't just need students presenting them and moving on. 
is that you want them to be compared. So has helps for students to have different visual representations and compare them. Like, what do we notice is similar? What is different? And so they, yes, multiple representations can encourage us flexible and creative thinking. And then what you want to say is, well, what do you notice that's similar? What's different? How? What do we find that's helpful in this one? What's helpful in this other one? And I think that sort of conversation around visual representations is really helpful. It's not every visual representation works well for every task. So what do we find helpful in this, and what do we not find helpful? I think some of these other questions that I see coming in are going to be covered as we um, continue our presentation. So Pam, I'm going to pass to you next to our next conversation about using the math tasks. Thanks, Jill. Um, what I'm going to do is actually dig into some examples because I think it'll help to be really specific about the ways in which we can use these tools. Um, the first task that we're going to dig into a little bit is called sharing jelly beans. Um, in this particular task, we're going to explore visual representations together while we engage in the mathematical task, experience language strategies in the context of problem solving. So as we pointed out earlier in the webinar, you can download these if you do not already have them downloaded. One strategy that we use to provide access to mathematical problem solving with English learners and low literacy students is to use a three-read process. This three-read strategy provides students an opportunity to think about the problem more deeply before they launch into a solution process. This is particularly helpful for English learners um, as they need more processing time to actually take in the language that's embedded in the task. So I'm going to start with going through what the problem's about, what you need to find out, and what important information is given in the particular task. In this section of the webinar, Jill and I are going to go back and forth, Jill being a student or um, someone that you're working with in professional development to really dig into these particular strategies. Um, it's really important in these processes to provide opportunities to engage with unfamiliar academic language. Reading it more than once will strengthen students' understanding of the text, although the three-read strategy can be done successfully individually or quietly. Um, repeated reading out loud in a group or class provides additional support to students who are English learners by providing opportunities for them to not only hear the words, um, but to hear them in the context of the problem. So um, we'll just engage here um, a little more deeply. So the first read is really to get a sense of the context in order to understand the story or the big idea of the text. The second read will be to discern the question or purpose of the text. The student will read the problem again in its entirety, looking specifically for information about what they need to answer or do to be successful. And the third read of the text is to gather important information to solve the problem or the purpose of the task. So as we look at this problem, and you'll notice that the problem is going to also appear um, in another screen as we look at the solutions as well. Jill, as you are reading over this problem, Hector had a bag of jelly beans. He gave one-fourth of the jelly beans to Susan. Then Hector gave a sixth of the jelly beans he had left to Pepita. After giving the jelly beans to Susan and Pepita, Hector had 20 jelly beans left in his bag. How many jelly beans did Hector have at the beginning? What is this problem about? The problem is about Hector. And he's sharing some jelly beans. What do you need to find out in this problem? Well, we're trying to find out how many jelly beans had Hector had at, at the beginning before he gave any away. At this juncture, sometimes we would spend a little bit more time writing out creating a co-constructed word bank where we talk about what do you mean by the beginning? What does it mean to have left? So we can start to really take a look at those terms in the process. 
So what important information was given in this problem? Well, you know that Hector gave away one-fourth of the jelly beans to Susan. Then he gave one-sixth of the jelly beans that he had left over, a sixth of those away to Pepita. And then he had 20. He had 20 in all? Jelly beans 20. left. Nope, at the end. At the end. What, um, what do we need to find out in this problem, by the way? We need to find how many had the beginning, and we don't know that. Okay. Um, and in this example, we would sometimes actually go through realia, acting out the problem so that by passing the jelly beans to one and then another and then he has some left, it makes it really clear what the problem structure is about. You were asked when you registered to download this, this particular um, problem and do it out. So what I'd like to do is take a minute for you to um, look at these representations and see which one looks closest to what you created um, when you solved this problem. I'll wait just a minute. I see a couple people have finished the poll. Just click on. Currently, we have about 40%, about half of folks now completed an example like the tape diagram provided in A. Only one person used, uh, represented theirs as in B. We have about nine folks, eight or nine folks who uh, did something like D. Um, and then we have some others that have represented their problem differently. What we're going to do is dig into these um, results a little bit more and look for those relationships that, that Jill talked about when I was just asking. So let's look a little bit more closely. When we, typically when we do this, we would get an assortment of uh, solutions like we just did on that poll slide. And what we would do in pairs with this particular problem is to have the students share the diagrams they started. Sometimes um, we do this before they're finished so that if we have students who are really having a hard time getting started, it's a little bit of um, traction for them to start to see, oh, I could start by creating some kind of rectangle or some kind of diagram. Um, when the students are finished discussing their diagrams, if we have students to differentiate, we could have them add additional diagrams to solve the same problem. So Jill, um, I see that you have a representation here. Can you tell me what relationships you see in this particular diagram? How, how does this diagram represent the candy that Hector or Susan or Pepita had? Well, I started with the whole tape diagram. And that one-fourth of Susan is one-fourth of the whole. So that red box of Susan shows a fourth of the whole. So that's interesting because it's not the same one-sixth for Pepita. It's not her one-sixth is of the section that was left, the blue and the green together. When you say her section, are you talking about all of this? Oh, thank you. Yes. So the diagram shows one... that. Where did the one fourth come from? When you're talking about one fourth, I see um, lots of boxes here. Where did where's the one fourth? Where did that come from? Well, the one fourth had to come from the very beginning. So if when we had this box, this is the other three-fourths. Oh, I see. So that's this 
red is one fourth, and then we have the blue and the green. That's one fourth, and the next two are one fourth, and the others one fourth. So all yep. four of those. Mm -hmm. Then we had to take what that happened here next, and I had to break this into six. Whatever had Hector before he shared any with Pepita. He had all this, the blue and the green, and then he had to break that into six and gave her the six, and then he had twenty left. Okay. What is the relationship between the amount that Hector has and the amount that Pepita has? <laughs> he didn't share. Very, he didn't share very well. Um, so he has five times as many. He has one, two, three, four, five to her one. Each of these boxes is the same size. The green How ones and the blue Pepita, ones are the same. Yeah, how does Pepita's amount compare to Susan's? Well, if I can split this, because this was a fourth and this was also a fourth, I know that Susan, this would be the same size as Pepita's. This would be that same six here. So Susan is twice as much as Pepita. Very nice. So as you can see, we could actually get students to draw on their diagram or add additional um, markings and point to things. The gesturing is really critical for um, students as they're explaining the relationships that they see in the diagram. As as um, Jill said, she saw the one fourth as this whole tape representing the whole bag of candies being divided into four equal parts, and those would continue to be partitioned further from there. Here's another example um, of a similar solution, um, and the, the steps are more apparent. Jill, can you talk about what, how this diagram represents the candies that Hector had? At the beginning or at the end? Ah, at the end. So this one, like you said, it shows the steps. And in some ways, for me, this is an easier one to see how it went from Susan to her fourth, getting a fourth, and then taking that same amount and splitting it, and then you can see what Hector has left here at the end. It's like an expansion of the other one. So you can see what Hector had left in green. And, you know, in this one, you can see that, so Hector, really what he has is five eighths. You can see if you can line that back up to the top. He's got five eighths, and Susan and Petita have three eighths. And that's a relationship you probably wouldn't see if you saw the saw the solved in in the equation without the visual. So where did the eighths come from? Well, I think there's there's five for Hector Hector, and there's one for Petita. That makes six. And then you just dotted that box of Susan's. Because you can see the red Susan box is the same as the white ones to the right. Mm -hmm. And this is, I see, there's a question here on the side about understanding about 12 and 6. And, and in some ways, you don't need to understand those fractional, those equivalent fractions of fourths and six to do this. I think the key part of understanding this is it's a fourth Susan is giving away, sorry, Hector is giving away a fourth to Susan of what he has, and then a sixth of what he has left. So the whole changes. That seems to be a key piece of this. And that's what you can see in yeah. this diagram, that, is that how that changes. So as Mary was asking this question, at first they don't necessarily need to know um, mm -hmm. what those particular fractions are because we first want to prompt to see if they notice the relationship. So we can start to compare, as, as um, was prompted in the, in the prior slide, that there's a relationship between what Pepita has and what Hector has left. She has one piece, and he has um, the additional pieces that you can see here, which are five pieces. So totally, what was left was divided into six 
equal pieces and he has five and she has one. As students start to look for relationships, they can start to see there's a four to one relationship, uh, excuse me, a one to four relationship that Susan has to the whole at the beginning. And so you can really start to have students dig into those relationships, which are critical for solving and understanding ratio and proportion. And um, another point that was po uh, pointed out here, which is a really good one by Anita, and that is um, uh, really thinking about precision and um, thinking that there are seven pieces. So for example, how do you avoid that pitfall of thinking there are seven pieces? I, one of the things when I used to teach physics, I would always or often when, when kids would ask a question, I would say it depends. It's really important that students orient, orient on what is the whole. So if we're talking about Pepita having one-sixth of something, she in fact does have one-sixth. She has one-sixth of what was remaining after the fourth was given to Susan. So it's really important to clarify as students start to talk about relationships, what is the unit? What is the unit that we're referring to here? How much he has left? How much he had after he gave some to Pepita? How much he had left after he gave some to Susan? What he had at the beginning? So those words, by defining them uh, at the beginning in a co-constructed word bank, for example, and continuing to refer back to them, and then making connections between those words and parts of this representation are critical for students to not fall into that um, pitfall, as you, you're pointing out, Anita, about thinking um, that what is that one piece a part of? What is the whole that we're referring to here? It's really important, as you point out, to be clear about what that, what that connection was. So, so let's just talk about this jelly bean problem for a moment. Um, as we're talking through this, in what ways did or could the sharing jelly beans experience support students to understand and use mathematical language? How did it or could it support students understanding mathematical language? If you have a thought about that, please uh, type your thoughts in the chat. So I'm going to pose the question to Jill at this point. So what do you think? What are the ways that this particular task could or did engage students um, to understand and use mathematical language. I think that leftover piece, when we use that phrase leftover, the sharing jelly beans experience with the diagram, I think, really highlights how the unit changes. And to me, that comes up a lot of, in a lot of algebra problems. We want students to see that. And that's a really complicated phrase, left over or, you know, of what he had left. That is, it's got some linguistic complexity in it that I think students can really benefit from a diagram to see that. And I think that showing the task in three, with three reads as well as even acting it out with some jelly beads can help that. And then I think the diagram helps that too. Yeah, and as Anita oh, has pointed out in the, in the chat, one fourth of the jelly beans and one sixth of the jelly beans he had left really do require them to think about, to notice. Um, one of the mathematical practices focuses in on look for and express regularity and repeated reasoning. We really want students to look for how is that structure of the problem, how is the structure represented in um, the diagram. So if you're thinking about Math Practice 7, look for and make use of structure, or Math Practice 
um, eight where you're looking for regularity. These types of things are really helpful for students to start noticing. How can visual representation support students' problem solving and mathematical structure in the classroom? I'll, I'll wait just a moment. I see Christine and Gilbert are, are typing. While they're typing, I just want to reinforce um, the point that Kim has is, is noted, uh, and that, in fact, co-constructed word banks, um, when you create them as the students confront particular language, is actually a much more um, useful and strong way of working with word banks. If the student sees words on a bulletin board but does not connect them to an example or a representation, they're less effective. So being able to create that word bank together as you work through the realia or work through the problem uh, is a much stronger approach. Gilbert notices that visual representations help students see what they are doing um, and really look for the structure in the result of what they've written. Very nice. And what do you notice about how visual representations can support students who are English learners specifically? As we talked about earlier and Jill pointed out as she was referring to the research, the representations provide opportunities for students who don't have all of their mathematical communication, all of their academic mathematic language completely mastered. They can refer to the diagram. They can use phrases from the problem and from the three read and point to and gesture to different parts of the representation as a way to engage and continue to develop their mathematical communication in the classroom. Let's look at another example. In this particular task we are presenting, we're asking students to not only represent the problem, but to use two different methods to find the answer to show their thinking. At least one of them has to be a diagram. So I'm going to give you just a moment to read the problem and then type into the chat. How might you engage with this particular problem? Anita poses a great question. This structure of the problem, since we're talking about structure, is very similar to the problem we had with band and chorus earlier. Would students see the connection? They may not see the connection in the words themselves, but once we start to put this problem into a representation, may begin to start to see the relationship. So Neil, or Nell, sorry, divide the band by five units so that each unit is 12 miles. Where did the five come from? Similar to the example with the band and chorus, Sam drove four times as far as Tara. So the five comes out of that four to one relationship in the problem. What, what do you suppose students struggle with with this problem? What might be a misconception or uh, an, 
error that comes up quite often with students. Because the five is implicit and not explicit, sometimes students actually um, solve this problem by looking at four when they create their diagram. So if I look at these examples, these are common uh, diagrams or representations that can solve this problem. Let's look for particular strategies that they could use. Oftentimes, if you look at A, for example, some students just draw the bar diagram or tape diagram that's there in white. They don't put in um, how much Tara drove. As we start to look at these diagrams, as Jill pointed out earlier, there are different representations for this same example. Some have different characteristics than others. Some are better for solving this problem. So let's look first for, can we see the relationship of Sam and Tara in example diagram A? Who would be represented by the blue in this example? Jill, can you help me out here? Who might be the blue in example A? Well, that's going to be Tara. OK, and why is that? How do you know that's Tara? <laughs> Sam drove four times as far, so he needs four boxes, where Tara only gets one. So these four boxes can represent four times as many as what Tara had. So these four here could be Sam, and this up top could be Tara. Are we able to solve this problem? And how would you solve this problem? How might we approach that? Well, I would look at it and say, Tara and Sam's total number of boxes has to give me 60 miles. So one, two, three, four, five boxes is 60 miles. So then one box would be 12. Where did the 12 come from, Jill? Where did, how did you find the 12? I did 60 divided by 12. I think that both John and Mary, oh, sorry, 60 divided by 5. I was just looking at that 5. Both John and Mary said they did the same way. Tape diagram, T is 1, and Sam has 4 Terra squares. Yeah, one, two, OK. Five. And we, we can see a similar um, example in this tape here, where this is Tara. And this is Sam. Let's mm -hmm. look at this, this number line right here. Where can you see the relationship on this number line? Yeah, I'm going to make little hops like you're doing. <laughs> so for this one, for Tara, we have four times as many for good old Sam. Where does that relationship show up here in the double number line in D? Let's move on a little bit and we can see that. So the relationship that we just talked about with Tara and Sam, you can see here. You can see how Jill set this up. And you can see that in this tape diagram as well. When we start to look at these different diagrams, the two tape diagrams afford us the ability, similar to the jelly bean task, where we can um, see that there is a 
relationship, a five to uh, one to four relationship in these examples. When we start to look at the number line example, we see a part to whole relationship. Given that the context of the problem includes distance, the number line is a great model as it's linear and mirrors the context. So it doesn't say in the problem um, that they drove at the same time. Um, and some kids kind of get stuck on that. So Tara drives a certain amount, and then Sam picks up and drives four times as much. What would be a good problem context, um, that, a richer problem, Jill, that would kind of explain this, this diagram? Well, I was kind of thinking about how I was responding to Mary's comment about how it's, in some ways, it's a solution tool that students need to have known may, may be presenting their thinking differently with something like this because of what they may have had to know to get to the 12. That's different than in the tape diagram. Sorry, that's not exactly how is that the question. How is that well, different? to get the 12 on here, Students found the found the number of steps. Students may have found the number of hops, and then went back to label their number line. And then the amount for Sam is how much he went after. It lo it looks like how much he went after, rather than the sum of the miles or combined miles. So, for I'm example, sure mathematically uh, different, but. Right, the relationships are the same, but the story mm -hmm. context could change. You could have them both yeah. driving, and they're driving mm -hmm. a distance of 60 miles, and Tara drives the first leg of the, of the problem, you know, of the trip, and then Sam drives the rest of the way, and he drives four times as far as Tara. So you can use the same structure. It's very similar to the, the problem that we had with the band and the chorus, but the representation may feel um, more authentic for some students to have a, as a linear rep representation because it's talking about distance. If we want to look at a different kind of, of relationship um, and we want to start to look at and think about rate, this might be an appropriate. Um, representation. So I'm going to I'm going to leave this up here for just a minute, and I'm going to pose the question to you all um, online. This diagram represents the distance that Tara and Sam drove. Where do you see those relationships? What do you notice in this double number line that you didn't see in the prior three representations? While you're thinking about what's here, I'm going to just pick up on what I'm noticing in the chat, the conversation that, that's being had by um, Brandon um, and Tara. So focusing on these different representations, for some students, they will see this um, much more readily with a tape diagram, while others will see it more readily as a linear or on a number line type of relationship. There are different ways to look at representing a sum or a total. Um, and some students can see it either way. There's not one preferred um, if we're just trying to find a solution. But if we start looking for particular relationships, and we want to, for example, think about constant rate, we can start to look at comparisons. For every one mile 
that Tara drives, Sam drives four times as many. You can start to see where those relationships can be seen here. If Tara drives 12 miles or 12 times as much as one mile, she can drive 12 miles. Sam, if he is driving four times as much as Tara, if they drove 12 times as much, he would have driven 48 miles. So if you really want to start to look at these kinds of constant rates and proportionality, students can start to notice things when you're looking at a double number line. They can look at rate. They can notice the multiplicative relationship between um, one place on the number line and another. So you can notice that in order to have a constant ratio, you would need to be multiplying the same amount on top or bottom or, or dividing um, so that that relationship stays constant. The other thing that is really powerful with double number lines is that you can focus in on what about these equivalent fractions. If I look at a fourth, one to four, two to eight, three to 12. So students can start to see where those relationships exist within a double number line. Let's explore another problem. And let's look more deeply at this problem. Jill introduced this Sam's motorcycle problem earlier, where she was asking just for you to notice the relationships. I want to just ask, uh, pose the question, how far can Sam go in one hour? And how might you find that solution? So I'm going to hesitate just for a minute to let you type in the chat. as you look at this example, this double number line here, what do you notice um, about the partitioning in this particular problem in the double number line? I'm noticing that Christine and Shama have pointed out 40 miles, 10 miles for every quarter hour. So where did that 10 miles for each quarter hour come from? I see a 30 and 3 quarters. How did you find or determine that it's going to be 10 miles for every quarter? Well, you can divide that 30 by 3. So 3 quarters, 2 quarters, 1 quarter. So one quarter, two quarters, three quarters. So if you have three for each one of these partitions, what does that represent? Well, I get 10 miles for one quarter of an hour, 20 miles for two quarters of an hour, and 30 miles for three quarters of an hour, 40 miles for four quarters of an hour. Great. So the partitioning gives a visual clue as well as a constant relationship like we just had in the prior double number line. So you can mm -hmm. start to see where that is. Let's take a look at this, um, this particular example. So how far can you go in three and a half hours? Think about your prior example. And you can see it up in the upper left-hand corner. How can we figure out how to go three and a half hours? I'm going to hesitate for a minute and let people think about this. I'm noticing that Nell has said 140 miles. Gilbert agrees. So where are these numbers coming from? How are we finding out that it's 140 miles and three and a half hours? Nell and Gilbert, can you just write in the chat how you figured that out? Where did, where did you do or how did you think about this to come up with 
140 miles. Okay, so Nell says 40 times 3 plus 20. And I notice also Shema has 30 times, 3 times 4 plus 20. Where does that, where does that come from? So 40 miles per hour times 3 and a half hours. So we can see it as an algorithm. I can multiply this out. Somebody else talked about half of 40. Where did that half come from? So if I go back to this prior double number line, we have people saying 3 times 40. So if I were to take this double number line and say, we said that this is going to be 10, and this is 20 miles, this is 30 miles, this is 40 miles. So if we're saying three and a half, we're talking about 40 miles times three for each of those three hours. And then we have, since we're asking for three and a half hours, we know that there's the additional half. So 40 times three is 120 miles that can be accomplished in three hours, and then another 20 miles in the half hour. So 120 plus 20 is 140. So there are some features of this particular task that are really important and helpful for English learners and struggling students. One, we have what's called a partially created diagram or a partially created um, visual representation. This is, some other people refer to this as a worked example. It's partially worked. We have visual cues that reinforce how this problem, key aspects of this particular problem, like the 30 miles and the 3 quarters of an hour, will translate to a double number line. You can see, again, those relationships that we talked about earlier, where if I multiplied something on either the top and the bottom here, that there's a multiplicative relationship. If I took 10 and multiplied it by 4, I would get 40. If I took 1 fourth and multiplied it by 4, I'd get 4 fourths, which is a, a 1 here. So what's really nice about and what this particular representation affords us is to make visible those structures that are inherent to the problem. So this relationship of 30 to 3 fourths or 10 to a fourth, it's constant. We have these equivalent fractions that, that um, if you looked at the 10 to a fourth, although this is not as nice to look at, you'll see that this is a constant relationship. Um, and then you can use that. Some students might, on this next page, actually redraw all of these, where others generalize from the prior um, visual representation. It is really helpful for students to be able to notice the structure and take that structure and move that forward um, multiple times. Giving a partially created visual representation that's been provided helps students to extend their thinking to larger values using that multiplicative relationship that we pointed out. As a facilitator, you can model other types of questions that deepen thinking, such as how can you use the values you generated in the first double number line to answer the question? And students will start to notice those relationships. We would introduce the term rate, the same rate. Um, he was going the same rate the whole time. Um, and then you can apply that rate language, students will gain that academic language in the context of the problem and be anchored in the representation, as you can see here. Some students did it a little bit differently than um, the way that you have typed in the chat. 
some students actually rewrote this out and started to look for, um, if we know it's 40 for 1, it's going to be 80 for 2, it's going to be, uh, and so on, 120 for 3, and so on, and found that we were going halfway in between. So they were doing equal intervals, 40, 80, 120, 160, halfway between those, this difference is halfway between the 120 and 160 came out to 140. So some students may apply the procedure to find it. Others might take the first diagram and use it um, in that way. And others may actually create another one and generalize from the, the halfway between or the equal distance between those intervals. So it provides multiple different entry points into that problem. So what I'd like to do before we transition to how to get additional resources and additional research and tools, um, what we're going to do is have you think about for a moment um, what are some takeaways from this particular um, webinar at this point. So we'll transition. And you'll notice to the right of the chat, there's another box, another um, window for you to type in. So everyone that is participating, if you could type in there, what are some of the takeaways um, that you have? And I'm going to summarize in just a moment. Um, but I'd like you to type in, what are some of the takeaways you have so far? One of the most difficult parts of teaching is wait time. So I'll try to be patient. Wonderful, wonderful takeaways. I'm going to highlight some of these things as they're as they're coming in. Hopefully, I'm not going to disturb your typing. Um, this connection between concrete, representational, and abstract approach is really important, and um, I appreciate that that's being pointed out. As you could see, when we got to the poll slide where there were um, multiple different visual representations for that particular problem, I'm going to just point that out again while we're waiting for folks um, to come in. Each of these representations each provide the same solution. So by providing these different ways of thinking about the same problem, students might notice different relationships. So for example, when we were looking at this poll question, Jill pointed out that the tape diagram that she had here in A, which was by far the most um, presented by you all in the poll, this, is, this works really well to point out the final solution to determine what that value is. But F might be much more um, visible for some students to see the process. So the A may be good to see the solution, but you can see in F what these relationships are in each step of the process. Some other students may think about this as an area model rather than a linear model. And so therefore you can see all of the bag of candy here that was divided into force, and then those, those were taken from here, so once the student had taken the whole bag, divided it into fourths. Sorry about my sloppy drawing. 
Um, you could see the force, and then you could see how you can take those force and divide them up more fully. Additionally, some students may orient themselves to a, to a pie diagram or a, a circular area model because that's what they've seen before. And so therefore, they can see the relationships between one fourth for Susan and, and three quarters left before um, he gave any to Pepita. So there are different relationships that can be pointed out on these. So the, the point that some of you are making about providing several visual representations are really helpful. You'll notice in this diagram, you can start to see those relationships as well. I'm going to go back and um, let you all finish, and I will um, I'll provide some of our takeaways for a summary of the representation. You can use visual representations to provide access to mathematics problem solving. They can be used as thinking tools and representation tools. They can enhance mathematical communication because they provide an opportunity for English learners and low literacy students to recognize relationships that exist within the problem and can then start to develop that relationship through focusing on and gesturing with the representation. There are opportunities to reinforce multiple mathematics uh, mathematical practices, as we pointed out, two that are particularly strong and the examples we use are to look for and make use of structure and look for and express regularity and repeated reasoning. You'll see that students also start to get better at constructing arguments and critiquing the reasoning of others when you do um, paired work and small group work and when they have to explain and justify why they created a particular type of representation. How do you get access to these tools and resources as well as the webinar recording? This can be accessed at REL Appalachia events. We will be sending out about a week from now a link to the archive of this webinar as well as access to the PowerPoint slides, handouts, and uh, references to all of the research that we provided as well. If you want to take the time before you hang up today, you can also download these resources from the download pod. Another feature of the Regional Education Laboratory Program is what we call the Ask a REL Reference Desk. If you are interested in research around a particular educational topic, you can go to the Ask a REL website, ask the question, type it into the Ask a REL form that's online, and then you will be, within four to six weeks, you'll end up with a resource come back to you that has um, the references, referrals, brief responses with citations about the question you ask. For example, if you wanted to know what type of mathematical skills and knowledge predicts that success in Algebra 1, what does the research say about strategies or interventions to improve algebra, and you can um, actually use the caveat that, say, if you're looking at upper elementary or middle school or whatever, ask your question, post it into the web, and then that will be sent to you. The form looks like this. You just type in, put your full name, email address, the state, um, and the question. And be, once you put your email address in, they'll know who to get that response back to. If you're interested in the REL Appalachia newsletter, it talks about the different events such as this one and others that are put on by the RELs, um, you can just go to sign up. The link is in the chat pod. You will now um, be asked to please fill out the stakeholder feedback survey just to give us a little feedback about um, what you learned today, what your interested in, and also these kinds of survey results help 
to um, inform us how to make these types of presentations and activities better for you and others. So thank you so much for your engagement today. The survey link is also in the um, chat pod now. So if you want to just link on it. Um, if you don't, it will come to you within the next 20 minutes or so in your email as well. So thank you very much today. Thank you, Carmen. Thanks, Jill, for um, engaging together on this webinar. And thank you very much to our technical staff as well.